One of the more interesting factions in Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is the Gino Haradan, or the Gino Haradan, depending on how you want to pronounce it, and they are the super secret sect of bounty hunters that you can be inducted into in KOTOR 1. The game paints them as this kind of ultimate mystery group, a bunch of super secret assassins that affect the galactic and political stages through targeted assassination. And in the game, you can work for them or you can undermine them. But there is no sort of resolution to the existence of the Geno Haradan in the game. And then of course they were completely removed from Knights of the Old Republic 2, despite the fact that they were actually meant to play a bigger role than they did in Knights of the Old Republic 1, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But what exactly happened to the Geno Haradan? Did Hulas manage to kill the rest of the Overseers and take complete control, or did they simply disappear into history? Now we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but first let's take a look at who the Geno Haradan truly are, and where did they come from? Well, in case you're unaware, the Geno Haradan actually existed before the Republic. They were created by Zim the Despot to essentially act as a secret force to eliminate his enemies. But if you're aware of that part of Star Wars history, Zim didn't last very long, and it was presumed that the Geno Haradan were disbanded or destroyed along with his death and the end of his reign. But this wasn't true. The group was still led by a guildmaster, a person with internal power that was connected to Zim, and they didn't just let go of that power. They decided to essentially reforge the Geno Haradan into something different. They became an assassination group for hire, and they would be paid extremely well by extremely powerful people, who wanted to take over the vacuum of power left in the galaxy after the destruction of the Infinite Empire, and of course all of the other political powers that were slowly evolving and rising to the occasion. But over time, the Geno Haradan began to realise that their actions actually began to shape the galaxy, and instead of just taking jobs for the sake of earning money, they actually began to see their clients and their benefactors as being more beneficial not to themselves, but to the wider galactic community. So they actually started to become very picky on who they assassinated and who they worked for based on their influence and their place of power within the political landscape. Now by the time that the Galactic Republic began to form, the Geno Haradan were essentially licking their lips because for the first time in their history, they had a noticeable and stable political power. And they saw this as an incredible opportunity and so they essentially focused all of their interest into the Republic's corrupted inner workings and began to do the dirty work, the hidden work that the governments and the people of the Republic weren't willing to admit or acknowledge and the Geno Haradan were essential, they were influential in building up the Republic's repertoire and they did that without even being known. However, to manage this new growing power within its own community, the Geno Haradan got rid of the concept of a guildmaster, and this is where they split up and they created the overseers of the guild that were four different people. This is the Geno Haradan that we see in Knights of the Old Republic. In the game, we meet Hulas, the Rodian, who is one of these four overseers, who essentially tasks us with taking on a number of bounties, but his actual intent was to kill the other three overseers, who are a Gamorian, a changeling and a Selgath, so that he can become the Guildmaster, essentially bringing it back to how it used to be. Now, despite the fact that the four of them lead the entire organisation, they actually didn't know who each other were. Their identities were kept as a complete secret from one another and from the galaxy, but Hulas managed to discover the identities of the rest of the Overseers through a lot of hard work. And he sees Revan as the only possible person in the galaxy that could be able to get close to the rest of the guildmasters of the Geno Haradan to eliminate them. But of course, in the canon story of KOTOR 1, Revan refuses and Hulas essentially realises, well, there's no one that can help him and we don't ever hear from them again. Now this is where we move into KOTOR 2. Do you guys remember Batu Rem on Telos and the imposter that impersonates him? Well, that entire section was supposed to be Geno Haradan related, but they cut it from the game, and that's why it's a bit obscure and doesn't really make any sense. And this also goes for when you side with Zerka on Telos too. There's a whole section where you're doing an arms deal, but it ends up going wrong, 
and the people that you were doing the deal with were essentially meant to be the Gino Haradan that were meant to set up the bigger events later down the road. We then move on to Narshadar and they were supposed to play a much bigger role. Under the Jet Jack Tar was supposed to be a Gino Haradan hideout and instead of it being the exchange that you were fighting, you were supposed to fight the Gino Haradan. The bounty hunters hired by Goto were actually challenging the Gino Haradan to get the Jedi exile first. And there's also another big piece of cut content that shows Darth Nihilus and Darth Sion betraying each other. And all of this stems from the fact that the Jedi exile was presumed dead in the Gino Haradan hideout after the Gino Haradan essentially announced that they killed her. The leader essentially blows up the entire facility to keep the Gino Haradan's existence safe. And everyone believes that she was killed in the explosion. This is how the entirety of the Nashadar section was supposed to play out. But it was all eventually changed to be the exchange, <laughs> that rhymed, and the Genos never made an appearance, which I think is a real goddamn shame. Anyway, moving on, the Gino Haradan then did begin to slowly lose its influence over time, but they didn't completely disappear. They do appear in the Old Republic MMO in the Bounty Hunter storyline, as the Bounty Hunter becomes the Republic's most wanted. The Gino Haradan take up the bounty, but they fail and they're all killed. And they are also contacted by the Supreme Chancellor in the MMO to assassinate the Empress of the Empire and the leader of the Eternal Alliance so that the Chancellor can take the spot. But this fails, the Gino Haradan don't manage to kill either of them despite their attempts. We also know that the Gino Haradan were present just before the events of the Clone Wars, but how do we know this? Well, they're actually mentioned in the novel Darth Plagueis. Now, there was nothing particularly big about their mentioning, nothing in detail, but they were mentioned as a sect of secret assassins that still existed. We can then only assume that they continued on, and they began working for the Empire, and then the New Republic, and so on and so forth. Now, I personally would have found it fascinating if Darth Sidious actually used the Gino Haradan in his attempts to take over the Republic, and I think that there was a fantastic opportunity for a bit of storytelling and a bit of connection to the Old Republic there. But of course, the EU is eventually obliterated, and you know, we never got any more about any of that story. But I think that it would have made complete sense. Somebody like Darth Sidious would use the Gino Haradan, it's in his nature. He would understand and utilize a group of assassins that were always somehow on the right side of the political spectrum. I highly doubt that they would have focused on supporting the Republic from the shadows during its downfall when they probably felt that they were more useful to a potential galactic empire, so that's my theory on that front. I also personally really hope that the Gino Haradan have a bit more to do with the KOTOR remake. As we all know, there is a lot of writing going into the KOTOR remake and we can only assume that they're going to expand upon certain aspects of it. And I think the Gino Haradan is one area of the original game that could, and in my opinion should, be expanded upon. And I would in no way be disappointed if they did do that. But as we begin to wrap up this video, that essentially is everything we know about the Gino Haradan. And I think it's a real shame that we never got to see them in KOTOR 2. There is a lot of hints and there is a lot of pointers to the Gino Haradan having an effect on the wider universe in that game. And I think it was, it was a shame that it got cut. I think it would have been more interesting than the exchange, but that's just me personally. And I want you to let me know down in the comment section below, would you have preferred to have seen the Gino Haradan in KOTOR 2 instead of the exchange? Do you wish that it never got cut? Or were you happy with the exchange's inclusion in the game? Let me know. As always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button to tell YouTube that you had an absolutely riveting time. And if you haven't, perhaps consider subscribing to join the biggest growing Knights of the Old Republic community on YouTube. I'll see you guys in the next video. But until then, may the Force be with you. Always.